Hello and welcome everyone. In this video I want to share with you how I make these wooden climbing holds. Maybe it will inspire you to make your own wooden climbing holds or you might spot some hacks or draw inspiration for your own woodworking project or you're someone who really enjoys watching stuff being made. So let's jump straight into it. I am going to use the following tools. A bandsaw, a belt sander, a trail press, the Arbotech mini grinder which is basically a 50mm angle grinder, a sanding pad on an angle grinder, and my hands. The carver's vise by Veritas is super useful if you're into any sort of carving. I will go more into detail about each tool when I guide you through the process of how I make the following holds. This walnut pinch. As the name suggests, this type of hold is typically used by pinching it with your fingers and your thumb. This purple hard ash sloper. A sloper is defined by the sloping shape and typically quite difficult to hold. This sloper is still quite positive and intended to be used on steep, overhanging climbing walls. Next is this crimp made out of sported beach. A hold where only the fingertips can be used to hold onto is called a crimp. The last hold is this walnut jug. This is the most positive and thus easiest hold of the four holds. At this point you might ask yourself, why wooden climbing holds? Aren't climbing holds made out of polyurethane or resin? There are some big advantages of wooden holds once you get used to the fact that they have less friction. Firstly, they aren't as aggressive on your skin. This is especially important if you want to train regularly and save your skin for outdoors climbing. Secondly, it's also easier to get started making your own wooden climbing holds if you compare it to the process of shaping and molding holds out of polyurethane. Making wooden holds can also be cheaper especially if you already have a woodworking workshop. And lastly, there is the environmental aspect, especially if you're using locally sourced hardwood. Let's start with cutting out the rough shape on the bandsaw. Sometimes I come up with a new shape, in this case it is going to be a big walnut pinch. But often I use templates to outline the rough shape. These templates were copied from previous shapes, which turned out decent enough to be replicated. For some holds, I use multiple templates. This block of purple heart, laminated on top of ash, is going to become a small sloper. I am using the mounting rod of the carver's vise here, which enables me to make cuts that would otherwise be too dangerous. Since I am going to make a mirrored pair, I want to make sure that I can replicate the shape very well. That's why I am using a second template. I made the second template by reattaching the first offcut to the main block with double sided tape before performing the second cut. I remove the cutting marks with the belt sander. I also flatten the bottom surfaces of the climbing holes on the belt sander. You don't need a big belt sander, but it's convenient to have one if you use it a lot as I do. You might have already noticed that some of the holes have a bolt hole. I'm using a trill press to drill the bolt holes for countersunk M10 bolts. These are the bits that I use. A 20mm diameter Fosner bit, a 20.5mm diameter 90 degree countersink bit, and a normal 11mm diameter drill bit. You can also use a normal drill. The trill press just makes it easier to drill vertically. Let's continue with cutting the rough shape. For the bigger holes, such as this walnut chuck, where the outline has already been cut and sanded, I try to remove as much material as possible with the bandsaw. I use the bandsaw to perform cuts at different angles, mostly 45 degrees. For smaller holes, it doesn't really make sense to make these angled cuts, because using the power carving tools only is often quicker. The Carver's Vice by Veritas allows you to adjust the position and orientation of your workpiece very quickly while still being sturdy. I attach my climbing holes to the mounting plate with a DIY mount which consists of a T-nut sandwiched between two pieces of plywood. I also attached the Carver's Vice not directly to the workbench, 
Instead, I made an extension plate, which is attached to the workbench. This setup allows me better access around the vise. I use the Arbotech Mini Grinder, which is now called Mini Carver, in combination with the Mini Turbo Disc. This is a 50mm diameter disc with carbide teeth, and this tool is amazing. I have owned it for about 6 years, and I didn't have to sharpen the carbide teeth once since I bought it. And I made a lot of climbing holes with it, as well as big hands and picks. By the way, I am not sponsored in any way, I just want to share my experiences. I have also worked with the Arbotech Turboplane and Industrial Wood Carver Disc. These discs are super useful for larger carving projects, but it's not as ergonomic to work with them, mainly because they are so aggressive. They just feel more dangerous and require the operator to be fully focused all the time, especially when working with the Industrial Wood Carver. On the Mini Carver, the smaller diameter of the disc in combination with the extension arm improves handling and safety drastically and I rather trade a little bit of efficiency to increase safety. Let's start with the actual power carving. But don't forget to wear eye, hearing and lung protection. I always start with shaping the top surface of the climbing hold first. There is one specific thing I do a lot when I use power carving tools. Over the years I have developed the habit of keeping my upper arms bent and close to my torso when I want to remove a lot of material. This allows me to maintain good control and the movement of the power carving tool is linked to the movement of my upper body. This way of working with these tools is safer and it's also less tiring. I still have to control the orientation of the carving tool with my arms, especially its rotation, but most of the work is done by using my legs and my core. Shaping the Purple Heart Ash Sloper is quite straightforward since there are two constraints from the templates. I don't want to change the outline of the hold when looking down from above and I don't want to change the outline when looking directly from the front. Let's look at the beach crimp next. There is one constraint because I used the template. I don't want to change the outline of the hold when looking down at it from above. I also don't want that this crimp can be pinched. This means that I have to remove a lot of material from two of the three sides of the hold. In case of the walnut pinch, the power carving part is super short and only takes one and a half minutes in real time. After working with the mini grinder, I sometimes use a carbide disc on an angle grinder. This one is the Holy Galahad Flat Medium Disc by King Arthur's Tools. Especially the see-through capability is super useful. But I don't use it very often, mainly for features where the mini turbo disc is too aggressive or it's very difficult to control. For what I do, I think it's one of the tools that can be useful, but it's not a must have if you already own another power carving tool. Often, I jump straight to the sanding part. This is a 1400 watts wearable speed angle grinder in combination with a Velcro backing pad. 
most of the time I use 40 grit sandpaper. One sanding disc typically lasts about 10 hours before I need to replace it. Using the sanding pad is quite satisfying because the shape comes alive. If you want to use these large 125mm diameter sanding discs, it must be a variable speed angle grinder, otherwise you will just burn the sanding discs and the wood very quickly. The discs will also probably fly off all the time. This video is my 2022 version of how to make your own wooden climbing holes. Those of you who have seen my first videos might have noticed that I do a few things differently. That's why in this video I focused on explaining what I do and why I do certain things. In the past I was using the sanding pad on a drill. This method also works and it's very convenient because in most workshops you will find a drill. But if you're going to use a sanding pad on a regular basis, you will notice it's just not as ergonomic. I would also recommend going with a soft start angle grinder. It will increase handling and safety. When I make crimps and pinches, I often use a router to round off the edges. For most pinches, I use a round over bit with 10mm radius. In case of the crimp, I use a round over bit with a radius of 5 to 8mm. Because of the smaller bit diameter, I can use my Makita trim router, which is easier to handle. I often make an in-cut on the bandsaw. An in-cut creates a more positive, less slopey gripping surface and thus makes it easier to use the hold, or rather the hold becomes more usable for steeper climbing walls. Using the bandsaw is especially helpful when making symmetrical pairs of climbing holds, since I want to make sure that the in-cut sections have the exact same angles. The belt sander comes in very handy to remove the cutting marks of the bandsaw afterwards. Now to the finishing sanding. I have worked with different detail and orbital sanders over the years. So far none of them allowed me to skip hand sanding completely. All those tools are great for plain surfaces but they are just not ideal when it comes to curved surfaces. Even with a recent upgrade to Festool Rotex sanders, I can't completely skip hand sanding. But the Rotex sanders speed things up and they get rid of almost all the dust when connected to a vacuum, which is great. So here is what I typically do. I start with some good quality cloth sandpaper. 60 grit is ideal for most types of wood. 40 grit sandpaper makes scratches that are really deep and it takes too much time to get rid of them afterwards. When using only 80 grit sandpaper, the whole process takes too long. Using a long strip of 60 grit sandpaper allows me to use it in different ways and thus sanding becomes less tiring. For a lot of holes, I only use normal 80 grit sandpaper afterwards. If you do a lot of sanding, gloves come in very handy, otherwise your skin won't last long. Conversely, if you've been climbing a lot and you want to get rid of your thick, dry callus, you can sand a couple of holes without using gloves and your skin will be soft afterwards. Often I'm done at this point, but if I want to achieve a kind of dual texture or to highlight the grain structure, as it is the case for this hold, I keep going with 120 grit sandpaper. I'm using an old detail sander here, which I bought in the second hand store for 5 bucks. Then I continue with sanding sponges. They sand and polish at the same time and allow me to achieve this kind of shiny finish. After that, I typically go back to 60 or 80 grit sandpaper just to sand the grip area with a couple more passes and then I'm finally done with sanding. 
Let's see how the holes change their appearance during this process. Here's the before and after comparison. I drill a few more holes for countersunk screws. Here, I mark the drill locations because I want them to be arranged in a way that fits to the shape. There are two purposes for the additional screw holes. Either the climbing hold can be mounted with a couple of screws only, without using a bolt, or if a bolt is used, at least one additional screw is used to prevent the climbing hold from spinning, which can be very dangerous when climbing. I clean up the drill marks with some old sandpaper. This isn't too much work, but it makes a difference. In the final and last step, I use a small laser engraver, which I bought on Banggood, to engrave my logo. A fan helps me to get rid of the smoke. The fan not only helps to reduce the smell, but it also helps to clear the laser beam from smoke, and by doing so it improves the quality of the engraving. If you're interested in my work, you can also follow me on Instagram at wolftobias or you can check out my website wolf.com. I hope this video gave you some sort of inspiration. Thanks for watching and see you next time.